can make a kick off. I just would like to welcome you all here um, this evening to Owen Mitchell's offices. I'm Amanda Stevens, one of the partners here, but more importantly for tonight, I'm a Governor of the Expert Witness Institute, along with Thomas Wolford, who's going to be giving all his hot tips, and David Sanderson, who's my favourite barrister, I can't say that long time. We've known each other since. <laughs> and since I was an article clerk, which is a very long time ago, so I know you're in for a real treat tonight, and I'll hand you over to these two very good gentlemen to look after you. I'll slip it back. Do you want to just introduce yourself first so that people know who you are and where you come from in business? Uh, I am, as Amanda says, David Sonson. I've been a barrister for a long time. I think I was called in 1985. Uh, and I have practiced for the last 14 years from 12 King's Bench Walk, which is the address you see in the bottom right-hand corner of each slide. Uh, our chambers specialize in personal injury work, clinical negligence work, and employment work, and of those three specialisms, I do personal injury and clinical negligence. And I'm Thomas Wolford. I run a company called Expert Evidence, which specializes in the wider field of dispute resolution. Expert witness work is certainly the largest constituent of that, and I specialize, in having been a banker, in financial work, tax work, investment work, and also the business has expanded into crime in looking after issues like insider dealing, fraud, money laundering, and confiscation of assets. And finally, um, just when I thought that was going quite well, it's become very international. So I do cases in this country, in North America, in the Channel Islands, across Europe, and in the United and in the Middle East. Yeah, that's a good point to actually say. Would everybody like to please put their phones on <laughs> silent, <laughs> so we don't get too disrupted as we go through this? Now, David can give you the position from a clinical standpoint, I will do it from the much more general role as an expert, and hopefully it will be both useful and interesting to you in how you run your expert meetings. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, we'd be grateful if we could please record this session. That's only us as the speakers, not you obviously in the audience. Um, and as you asked, consulted you earlier. Um, I understand that nobody objects to that. And finally, while we're actually talking, there is a sheet here that we'd encourage you to fill in at the end to actually give us some feedback on whether we have addressed the right issues for you and whether you have appreciated the talk and how we can improve it. If you go on to page two, just to make certain, and one or two people got it wrong last time we did one, Five is the high score, so hopefully we get some fives. And one is the low score. But um, thank you very much. And with that, I think I hand over to you for the. No, sorry, it's me for the first one. Are we? Fantastic. Very good. Now, formally, the experts meeting is a meeting of the experts specifically to narrow the issues which the court needs to consider. Therefore, what you're seeking to do is find out between the two professionals who come together the points that you can actually agree on as far as the case is concerned and those where you disagree. And the points where you disagree the reasons for the disagreement, which may be different assumptions, different background and experiences, different industries, etc. But it gives you a chance to actually explore what the reasons are for the disagreement so that the judge can consider them separately, particularly in a civil action or in a criminal action for the jury. And it becomes, therefore, probably one of the most major and important pieces of information because it's concise and it actually deals with the bits that they actually have to decide on in finding a solution to the case. Now, 
Uh, my experience is in civil law, and uh, it occurred to me just literally as Thomas was speaking then that there may well be rules and practice directions uh, within the criminal, uh, criminal context with which I am less familiar. What we have set out in one of the papers that you'll find in your pack, the one um, entitled The Expert Beating Framework Issues, are the, uh, these, these two uh, rules. The first is uh, CPR, standing for the Civil Procedure Rules, Part 35. Part 35 is the part of the Civil Procedure Rules which deals with experts generally, and Rule number 12 is the rule that uh, deals specifically with the expert meeting. And the, the second uh, document is the practice direction, from uh, uh, which is attached to part 35, uh, and that contains some uh, explanatory and expanding material as to, again, the expert meeting in section 9. Now, if you, um, I think that they, these are probably set out in two places in your pack. I think uh, Thomas has set them out um, on a standalone <coughs> document which he's holding up there, and they are also set out in the body of my document. And if I can ask you to, to open up either one or other of those, uh, and I'm just going to take you through. Um, without actually expanding upon the rules, particularly at this stage, just take you through what the rules are, because uh, in the course of the succeeding slides, we will essentially expand upon uh, each element of the rules as they appear. So, um, the, uh, taking part 35.12 first, uh, the first opening uh, paragraph of the rule essentially sets out what it is that Thomas has just said, the, the general purpose of uh, the discussion. That is to identify and discuss expert issues in the proceedings and where possible to reach agreement uh, and to reach an agreed opinion on those issues. Secondly, uh, the court can specify the issues which the experts are to discuss. We'll come to, to that and to an agenda in a moment and what the usual practice of that is. Thirdly, the court may direct that following a discussion, the experts must prepare a statement, although it says they may direct, the court invariably will direct that a joint statement is prepared, and that is the statement in which the experts record what it is that they have agreed, what it is that they've disagreed, and a summary of the reasons for those disagreements. And then importantly, at paragraph four, the content of the discussion between the experts shall not be referred to at the trial unless the parties agree. And that's a very important matter which we'll come to in one of the later slides. Um, and then the final uh, section of the rule is one possibly of more interest to the parties and to the uh, legal representatives which is that where experts have reached agreement on an issue in their discussions, that agreement does not bind the parties unless the parties expressly agree to be bound by it. And then the second document, the practice direction, um, the, uh, that firstly uh, includes a direction to the parties to consider at an early stage whether a, a meeting is going to be useful uh, and then re repeats uh, uh, essentially uh, what's been set out in the rule as to what the purpose of the meeting is but adds a couple of uh, additional points which are important uh, that is that uh, in addition to uh, agreeing matters which can be agreed stating the reasons and identify uh, for the disagreements and identifying those disagreements it's also important to identify points of action which may be necessary in order to uh, resolve uh, existing disputes uh, and uh, to recall, uh, to uh, remember that uh, you're not bound only to consider issues that the uh, legal representatives have set out in an agenda. If that agenda has been drafted by the lawyers and not by uh, you and your uh, opponent uh, and you and your opponent feel that there are issues that are not covered in that agenda, you, your duty is 
to cover those in addition to what is set out in the agenda. Um, uh, part 9.3 deals with the agenda and uh, the need to agree one uh, where necessary, and it almost always will be necessary. Uh, 9.4, uh, and this is uh, an important issue, that the, unless ordered by the court, or agreed by all the parties and the experts, neither the parties nor their legal representatives may attend. So you're in control of that, and uh, it, it, unless the court orders otherwise, or everybody agrees, and the experts agree, <coughs> the parties shouldn't attend, and neither should their legal representatives. And indeed, it's my uh, universal uh, experience that they never do attend. I think that um, in Thomas's line of work, uh, sometimes the meetings are held at the offices of one or other of the solicitors, uh, and thereby that they may introduce themselves and, and get a little uh, uh, preview as to what the other side of these look like, but they do not attend the meetings. If they do attend the meetings, so on the rare occasion, not one in my experience, but on the rare occasion that they might, uh, the practice direction instructs that they should not normally intervene, so they're there as observers only, um, except to answer a question that may be put to them, or to advise on the law, should that be necessary. Uh, and uh, again, it reminds the experts that they're essentially in control of this. If they want to go off and have a, a meeting of their own uh, without the legal representatives, they can do that at any stage. So you can exclude them in the first place, or you can exclude them from the <coughs> um, Practically speaking, though, uh, as uh, I, mean, I think this is Thomas's experience as well, they don't usually try. You don't usually try to attend. They never have done with me. Then actually, um, then the, the uh, paragraph nine point six deals with the statement, the joint statement, as it's usually known, which must be prepared afterwards. It should be prepared at the conclusion of the discussion uh, or as soon thereafter as is practicable and in any event within seven days. So there's a very short time scale in which to draft the joint statement. And since this very often involves uh, it passing backwards and forwards between experts until a form of words has been agreed, um, and that can take some time, it's important that it's effectively started immediately in the first draft is done that day or the very next day. Um, the, uh, and, and this again, uh, the next rule again uh, emphasises the extent to which you, the experts, are in control of this process. You must give your own opinions and you do not require the authority of your instructing solicitor to sign the joint statement. Um, uh, but uh, if you have altered an opinion that you have previously expressed in a report that you have prepared and that has been exchanged, you must include in the joint statement an explanation for why it is that your opinion has now changed from that which you did previously. So those, that, that's the guidance that's given in the rule and in the practice direction. And what we'll attempt to do now in the remainder of the slides is to provide a little extra meat on those. Um, if I could just mention, the criminal area is actually done under the criminal procedure rules, number 33, if you want to look them up separately. They are, in general, quite similar, but we haven't sought to address that today as part of this lecture. It's really very sad in the English language that criminal and civil both start with the letter C. The CPR, obviously, the civil side, got it first, and the criminal side, therefore, have had to put CRIM PR 32, 33 rather, sorry, to actually encompass their rules. But we haven't tried to deal with that as part of this lecture this evening. Um, 